with Chief Balzer having uh, done the ODNR update. I think he's he's handed this off to his assistants. So uh, this time I'd like to introduce um, the assistant chief of the High Division of Forestry, who's been with uh, Department of Forestry for Division of Forestry for 20 years, uh, Greg Guess, and I think uh, Greg's going to give us an update here, and then he's going to pull in a couple of his colleagues to assist with that presentation today. And part of what they're going to do today, there are, is going to be a little bit of a focus on um, invasive species concerns and state forest management, uh, which was asked for by some of our members. So, uh, Greg, with that, um, we'll let you take over. Great. Um, Great. Give me a th thumbs up and just let me know you're hearing me all right. Okay, good deal. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, address OFA today and, and talk about some highlights from the Division of Forestry. Let's see. I don't think I've got control of the slides. There we go. Let me go back. Sorry about this. Learning the technology. Okay. So uh, large on our agenda um, in the last year has been uh, COVID like most people and, and learning to deal with this new environment. And I think in a lot of ways, we've been very successful in that. Um, a lot of our core mission in the field is, is getting done. And we're finding ways to get it done. And, and we're real proud of that. But not, not everything is the same. And one item that, that has been different for the last year, our offices have not been open to the public. So in, in the short term, um, we're uh, working on plans to open possibly late spring um, to where the public can, can come into our offices again. So we're, we're excited about that. There's no definite date and um, that may, what that means might vary by location, but, but we're excited to at least, uh, it looks like things might be getting back to normal. So, so that's a good thing. Um, really for our administrative uh, functions in the division, especially here in central office and some of our district offices, um, at, the work has been primarily happening um, at home. So that's been a very different thing for us, but uh, with technology this day, these days, we've been able to, to make that work pretty seamlessly. Um, you know, we, it's been a, a, a big transition to virtual platforms for all of our meetings and workshops and things like that, um, but, but we've learned a lot in this last year. Uh, one-on-one -on -one meetings in the field have continued to happen, um, maybe with interruption at the beginning, but uh, we've continued to meet with landowners one-to-one uh, -one if they're comfortable with that, just observing um, you know, appropriate guidelines uh, for distancing and uh, along with community officials as well, but a lot of outside meetings, um, you know, a lot of keeping distance, but still able to, to talk to people. So that's that's been important. So some things we have learned and come better equipped with, like a lot of people, is just being more adept at the virtual platform. Really, it's it's allowed a, it opened a door for us that we didn't really know was there. And um, you know, we spent a lot of times internally and externally traveling to meetings and and we spent a lot of energy to get together. And what we found is that, uh, not in all cases, but in, in some cases, we can be a lot more efficient doing things virtually. And, and what that, especially internal meetings, things like that, instead of having people travel uh, half the day to get to a meeting, you know, they can log in, uh, we can talk about what we need to talk about, and then they can get back out in the field uh, doing the core work of the division. So I think in the future, we're gonna come out of this stronger and uh, able to spend more time in the field um, doing, doing our core work. So uh, we're, we're excited about that uh, going forward. Um, other big thing that happened in this last year is we finalized our forest action plan. So that's a, a document we're required to do every 10 years um, as part of the farm bill. And uh, this requires us to look at the forest resource across the state and give that really broad strategic direction you know, for all ownerships of forest lands. And, and it helps uh, uh, direct our, our work in, in federal grant dollars in terms of uh, what, what the priorities are in the state. So it, that uh, action plan is really made up of two documents, the, the resource assessment, which is a little thicker document looking at um, you know, the science and the data of, of what's going on in the forest. Um, and then the second document is the strategy document, what we're gonna do about it 
how we're going to work with partners to address the issues we identify. So uh, those are being finalized as we speak, um, the uh, final sign off at the Forest Service, but that'll be uh, posted on our website um, shortly. Other big item that uh, happened this year, we were in 2020 was supposed to be a full recertification audit for our dual certification on state forest. And because of COVID, uh, we were allowed a, a, a fifth surveillance audit year. So we did a, a full virtual audit um, of sites, which was you know, new to both us and the auditors, but uh, we were able to successfully get that done. And then the plan is this year in 2021, We'll do a full audit on, on both standards, and we've got every uh, intention of remaining uh, certified into the future. And I won't go too much into that. I'll let uh, Jared Craig speak more of that in his presentation. So I'm going to hand this off um, to Tom Macy. Tom is our Forest Health Program Administrator, and he's going to get uh, into some details about some of the emerging uh, invasive concerns uh, in the state. So, Tom, if you're ready, I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Greg. Are folks able to hear me? All right, great. So, um, yeah, I'm going to take it from here. And uh, I was asked to give a couple updates on uh, some forest health pest and disease concerns. Um, so I'll do that here. Please. Things are, see if I can advance my screen here. There we go. Um, so just quickly to, to introduce the forest health program, that's the, the program that I administer within the Division of Forestry. Uh, the goal of that program is to monitor, eradicate, suppress forest pests, as well as conduct outreach and education to increase awareness of those pests within the state. And uh, you know, to, to reach that mission, uh, we work cooperatively with a lot of different organizations and agencies across the state uh, on some of these forest health issues. Because um, there, there's a lot going on and, and a lot of land to cover and, and people to try to reach with that. So the, the issues I'm gonna talk about today are oak wilt and spotted lanternfly. Um, a couple of things that we thought folks might be interested in getting a quick update on. Um, so for oak wilt, um, this is a fungal pathogen. And actually the, the origin, the native range of this pathogen isn't uh, completely known. Um, there's some theories that it may be native to Central America or possibly Asia. But with some of these um, fungal diseases, it's, it's really tough to know exactly uh, what their native range is in, in a lot of cases. Um, so this is a, a, a pathogen that affects oak species. Um, and it, uh, it's been around for, for quite a while. So it's not, it's not really a newly arrived pest, but there seems to, to be cycles where it, it flares up and we're seeing more of it uh, in the state and, and times where it seems to, to quiet down and we're not, not hearing much about it. Um, but what it does, it, it grows within and it clogs the vascular system of oak trees, uh, which kills them. And the red oak group is much more susceptible and um, red oaks are killed a lot quicker than white oaks are, although all oaks are susceptible. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, uh, in the white oak group, those species form tyloses, which prevent the movement and can kind of wall off the movement of that fungus within the tree a lot better, although they can be eventually killed by oak wilt within a couple of years. Um, whereas red oaks don't have that and uh, are usually killed in a single season from oak wilt. And that's actually interesting because that's the same reason white oaks are used, uh, you know, in barrels. Uh, they're watertight um, and, and red oaks are not. So this disease was first identified in 1944. And uh, we can see in that, that national map, it's present over much of the eastern U.S. Um, so it's been you know, known to be occurring here in Ohio going back to the 50s at least. Uh, and that map there on the right uh, is just some more recent locations of where oak wilt has been identified within the state. Um, the red counties are confirmed by the, uh, 
OSU and ODA jointly run uh, plant diagnostic clinic. Uh, and the other counties is where it's suspected or where they've received samples, but they, they came back negative for oak wilt. Um, so what does oak wilt do? Um, you know, the symptoms of it, you can see sort of uh, leaf scorch symptoms uh, in that top photo there where it, it almost uh, looks a lot like um, drought damage uh, where you have, you know, that, that browning of the margins of the leaves and the leaves then pre prematurely drop off the tree in the summer. Uh, and that's, it really is similar to, to drought symptoms because as that vascular system in the tree gets clogged up, uh, water and nutrients aren't, aren't reaching the leaves of the trees. Uh, sometimes oak wilt will form these uh, spore mats under the bark, which is in that second photo there. Uh, you don't always see this, um, but sometimes that can be a, a pretty telltale sign of oak wilt. And those spore mats grow under the bark and can sometimes uh, crack the bark. Uh, and if you, if you pull that bark back, you can find those spore mats under there. Um, as I mentioned with red oaks, they can be killed in a single season. White oaks takes two to three years. Uh, and what you often see in advanced cases of oak wilt in a, in a contiguous forest area are these pockets um, where it's moving from the introduction point and it, it actually is moving through the roots underground from tree to tree and you get these sort of uh, growing disease pockets out in the forest. Uh, but this is one that you really do need lab confirmation to confirm that you have oak wilt or not. There are different diseases, like I mentioned, drought, stress, um, you know, different leaf fungal diseases that can sort of look like oak wilt symptoms. So we really need that lab confirmation uh, where you're sending in some, some symptomatic branches uh, to the diagnostic clinic to get that confirmed or not. Uh, these are some images of oak wilt impacted trees. So there on the left, we can see on a sapling that's infected, we can see that, uh, that sort of scorching symptom on the leaves. And there on the right, this is a photo from Eastern Ohio of some you know, dead canopy red oaks that, that died just in the last few weeks uh, from when those images were taken uh, towards the, the end of the summer. So there's two main modes of spread for oak wilt. Uh, it, as I mentioned, it can move below ground. So oftentimes, you know, in a forest situation, you can have trees of the same species growing nearby. And when their roots contact each other underground, they can actually grow together and almost have a shared root system. Uh, we call that grafting. So when you get an infected tree, that fungus can move right through the vascular system of that tree through the root grafts into neighboring trees. And that's how you get that below ground spread. And that's the main uh, mode of spread for oak wilt. That's the, the major way that it's moving uh, through forest systems. Um, but then you can get above ground spread and that mainly occurs uh, when you get some sort of wounding, whether it's a pruned branch or storm damage breaks branches on an oak tree. Uh, there's a few different species of beetles in a particular family. They're also known as picnic beetles because um, they are attracted to sort of sweet smelling things. Um, so sometimes, you know, folks that are out on a picnic, if they have, you know, alcohol or something like that, um, these beetles can actually be attracted to that. So they're attracted to the wounded trees. Uh, and if a, if a infected oak tree is wounded, um, these beetles come to the wound to feed on the sap and they can pick up those oak wilt spores and, and move them to other trees above ground. So oak wilt is a, is a pretty tough issue to try to manage uh, in the forest. So, uh, you know, some, some recommendations that we have in areas where we know oak wilt occurs, uh, there's a recommendation to avoid pruning or doing some sort of otherwise uh, physical damage to oak trees during the growing season. And that's to avoid that overland spread that might attract those beetles to those trees and move oak wilt spores around. Um, another thing is when you've got oak wilt in a forested situation, we need to sort of somehow uh, break those root grafts to, to prevent the underground spread uh, of oak wilt. So what's been done in a lot of cases to do that are these, uh, these vibratory plows, you know, with heavy equipment that go in and they uh, 
basically need to trench around the infected area uh, down to four feet uh, with these large blades that can sever those root grafts and prevent the movement of this disease through. So pretty heavy handed management, not uh, a real easy one to try to carry out. So there's some new work being done to look into an alternative to that plowing and trenching containment method. Uh, where instead of using the, the, that heavy equipment to do that plowing, uh, we're actually using um, herbicides. We're girdling trees and, and applying herbicides to those girdle cuts that are made with a chainsaw, uh, essentially to try to, to kill those buffer trees. And if we, if we kill those trees and hopefully kill the root system, that should, you know, in effect, stop the underground spread of that disease through the forest. So, you know, there's, like I said, this is sort of a new, newer uh, management technique that's being developed. And there's some pretty good success that folks are starting to see with this. Um, so it's one that, you know, we're starting to learn more about and recommend more where we find oak wilt in forests here. Um, so, you know, following this treatment method, whether it's the vibratory plow or this girdle method, um, the infected tree should be removed because um, that fungus can still move, you know, within a season or two. And uh, any infected trees need to be debarked and split and dried as soon as possible uh, because those beetles can continue moving uh, the fungus around. So what about fungicides for treating trees? Um, and that is uh, uh, an option, but it's, it's a preventative measure, not a curative measure. So, you know, if, if there's high value trees in an area where oak wilt is known to occur, um, these fungicide injection treatments can be applied to that tree on an annual basis to protect it from getting uh, the oak wilt fungus. Um, but there's no way once a tree has the disease to, to essentially cure it or try to save it uh, from oak wilt. Okay, that's, that's all I have for oak wilt, so I'm gonna, um, finish here talking about spotted lanternfly. Uh, this is one that folks may have been hearing about over the last few years, um, but it was first discovered in southeastern Pennsylvania in 2014. Uh, since then, it's been found in a handful of other states, and uh, Ohio now is the latest one to, to confirm uh, spotted lanternfly infestation, so I'll talk a bit more about that. But it's a plant hopper insect that's native to Asia. Um, the, uh, the way it probably got into the U.S. was on um, decorative landscaping stone that was imported from Asia. Uh, there was an area pretty close to where they first found this uh, in Pennsylvania that uh, imported stone from Asia. So that's likely the route that it came in. Uh, these insects lay egg masses, kind of like gypsy moth, and they can lay them on you know pretty much any uh, surface, you know, fences, tree trunks, uh, train cars, landscape stone, that sort of thing. So they're a pretty efficient uh, hitchhiker and moving around uh, with, with human assisted movement. Um, but they're pretty large for a plant hopper. They're an in, about an inch long, the adults are. Uh, and that's what's pictured there on the, the top right is an adult spotted lantern fly, as well as the image below that with the wing spread. Um, you would only see those, those red hind wings when the, the insect is in flight. Uh, when it's at rest, like that top photo, it's, it's mostly just gray with those black uh, spots on it. And uh, earlier in the season, in the spring, you, you'd only be looking for the nymphs, which are pictured there in the bottom, those black and red uh, nymphs that don't have the fully developed wings yet. They're pretty small. Uh, they're much smaller than the adults. Um, so not, not as easy to spot, although with their bright coloration, it, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, so this insect feeds on a lot of different types of plants. Uh, although it does seem like it has some favored host plants that it, it, it feeds more on. So Tree of Heaven, Ilanthus, is a favored host for it. And, uh, you know, you might be thinking, well, this is great if it's going to affect and, and kill Tree of Heaven, which is another non-native invasive plant. But I don't think, you know, we've, we've seen that it's actually going to be an effective, you know, biocontrol, so to speak, for Tree of Heaven, unfortunately. Uh, it's also quite fond of grape. Uh, so there's a lot of concern for the grape industry, um, the wine industry with this pest. 
because they can do quite a bit of damage to uh, grape vines and vineyards. Um, and another thing that they do is they're a prolific producer of honeydew. That's their excrement, which is basically just a, a sugary liquid substance, a sticky substance that they excrete. Uh, and what happens is when that when that's excreted, uh, it can coat you know any leaves or whatever is beneath the the feeding spotted lanternflies, and that gets then uh, colonized by a mold called sooty mold, which sort of has this black crusty uh, growth to it. So that can impact potentially uh, you know regen of forest understories where these insects are are really common. Um, I was going to show this video. I'm not sure if it's going to work, uh, but it's a video showing a, a pretty heavy infestation of spotted lanternfly on grapevines. Um, and I don't look, it doesn't look like it's going to pop up for me, but it just showed um, how they basically shoot out that honeydew, uh, almost like a squirt gun or something, and it co just coats the plants beneath it. So back in October of 2020, um, a photo of an adult spotted lanternfly was reported to OSU and Ohio Department of Agriculture by a business owner in Mingo Junction, which is in far eastern Ohio in Jefferson County. Uh, and then so that was followed up by surveys with a few different agencies, including Division of Forestry. We helped out with that. And at that time, we discovered about 50 adult spotted lanternflies as well as egg masses uh, in that area. And it's a pretty small area. Uh, there's a little Ilanthus stand next to uh, State Route 7, also kind of sandwiched between State Route 7 and a railroad. Um, so, you know, we, we feel pretty strongly that it's likely that these lanternflies entered Ohio on train cars. Um, there's a, a pretty large rail yard there in Mingo Junction, which uh, actually sees Every weekday, it sees about a couple hundred train cars carrying trash from New Jersey uh, to a landfill in Ohio, which was pretty amazing. I, I wasn't aware of that type of thing happening. But um, so where this insect is established in the east, it is established in New Jersey. So it's likely that uh, it moved on those train cars uh, here to Ohio. Um, so we have a. a interagency team within Ohio that's working on spotted lanternfly. Uh, we've been meeting regularly since last spring uh, to plan, you know, education, outreach, management plans for, for the eventual reality of, of SLF showing up here, which it now has. Uh, so the Ohio Department of Agriculture is working on implementing a quarantine to try to help reduce the spread of spotted lanternfly from Jefferson County. Uh, they're also planning to do chemical treatments in attempts to eradicate it from that infestation that we know of in Jefferson County. Uh, there's also been, you know, a lot of um, outreach and education happening. A lot of that's happening from OSU Extension. Uh, they've developed a fact sheet on spotted lanternfly that you can look up online. Uh, Amy Stone with OSU Extension recently did a, a really nice webinar that's available on YouTube um, called Spotting the Spot. And she did an update on it, which gets a lot more into detail on spotted lanternfly if you want to learn more about it. Um, and quickly here, just to, to wrap up, um, we, Division of Forestry, recently helped out with the spotted lanternfly effort. Uh, we got some funding from the Ohio Grape Industries Committee. And uh, we used that funding to work with Division of uh, Wildlife uh, to map Atlantis from the air, from helicopter, uh, across a pretty large area of eastern Ohio um, in several counties to, uh, to map Ilanthus. And uh, Ilanthus is pretty easy to pick out from the air, um, so it's a pretty efficient way to cover a lot of ground uh, and identify uh, Ilanthus populations because the, the female Ilanthus trees hold onto those seed pods, which you can see there in that uh, sort of middle photo. Um, and they're pretty easy to see, see from the air. So, you know, this method allows us to cover a lot of ground in a relatively short amount of time. So it's actually a much cheaper, much more efficient method than trying to map a uh, tree of heaven from the ground. So we have these uh, results now. We, we mapped a lot of Ilanthus, and that's going to help us then 
go in on the ground uh, this coming year and into the future and go to those areas where there is tree of heaven and survey for spotted lanternfly um, since it is so attractive to the insect. So we'll be doing that to help uh, guide survey here in the future. Uh, this is the results of what we flew. So that yellow shaded area uh, is the area that we flew a little over half a million acres we covered. Um, and this is Eastern Ohio. So um, Jefferson, Harrison, Columbiana and Mahoning counties. And uh, like I said, we, we mapped quite a bit of Atlantis. All those little red polygons are areas where we, we were mapping Tree of Heaven, which totaled uh, almost a thousand polygons and uh, uh, almost 4,000 acres worth of Atlantis out there. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, you know, if you think you have found spotted lanternfly, uh, we're urging folks to try to collect the insect if they can in a bag or a jar, uh, or at the very least, try to get a quality photo of the insect and make a record of the location that you saw it. Uh, one convenient way to do that is using the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app uh, that you can download on your smartphone to make a report. You can also contact Ohio Department of Agriculture, their Division of Plant Health, the phone number's there, and there's their website. Um, if you Google Ohio Department of Agriculture spotted lanternfly, you'll get to their website, which has a nice uh, reporting tool there as well. So I think that's all I had. And um, happy to take questions at the end of the talk, but I'm going to now hand it over to Jared Craig. I'm going to give him remote control here, who will be uh, talking about some land management on state forests. All right. Um, is everyone able to hear me just fine? All right. Yes. All right. So I'm just going to take a few minutes here to give kind of a uh, brief overview of the management that we do on the state forest. Uh, you know, most of our state forests are located in the you know southeast part of the state. We have a few in the north. So it's something that um, you know a lot of folks in OFA. Uh, aren't always familiar with. They don't see a lot of the state forest management that goes on, but um, something that we're really proud of here at the division and, um, you know, like to promote so that, you know, people in the industry can see what's going on on the state forest. So as Greg uh, mentioned before, when he spoke, uh, we are dual certified. So that's through FSC and SFI. Uh, we've been certified since 2010. And the way that works is every year, those um, companies send auditors to look at the state forests. Uh, they uh, assess us against all the standards that are part of that system. And so this past year in October, which is generally when the audits are conducted for us, uh, this past October, we did a virtual audit, which was uh, more of a paper review of the, the things. You know, we we actually took drones and flew those over some of our harvest sites um, so that they could uh, see a little bit of what that was stuff that normally they would be uh, walking on the ground to look at in person. So um, definitely an interesting experience, um, but we're hopeful, you know, that this next year uh, in October coming up that we'll be doing another in-person audit and that one will actually be a full certification audit. Um, so that goes on a you know, five-year cycle. Um, and every five years, they assess us on every standard that there is um, to do the recertification. Uh, also, we'll be updating our five-year forest management plan in 2021 as well. Um, and so, just to talk a little bit about the plans that we have in the division. Uh, we have the five-year management plan, which is a uh, more broad, larger scale uh, plan. It outlines our desired future condition of the forest, um, talks about our growth and yield models that we use to uh, determine our harvest uh, allowances and that, that type of thing. Uh, and then we also have our annual work plans, which by the name come out every year. And those are broken into uh, 
each district or work unit has a plan. And those go more into the specifics of, of what we do. So specific harvest cruises um, at an operations level, you know, any sort of uh, trail maintenance and that sort of thing that um, might come up. And so all that feeds into a general cycle that, that happens every year. And I'm gonna go through each of these things in turn. Um, and a lot of this has overlap, but in a general sense, this is kind of the, the process that we go through to arrive at the management we do on the forest. So we start with prescription cruises. These are just baseline inventories that we do um, around the forest. And based off of those cruises, we'll come up with recommendations for harvest activities. Um, and throughout the year, we'll do timber marking in those areas. And then from there, obviously those timber markings will generate timber sales uh, that are advertised uh, to the industry. And then through all of that, we end up back at the beginning where we make a work plan for the following year based on uh, what was accomplished in the previous year and what we've identified uh, that we'd like to work on in the next year. And then the overarching thing um, from all this that uh, happens is over the whole year, we have uh, timber sale administration going on. So once a sale is sold, uh, the logger generally weather permitting uh, can come in and do the harvest um, you know, on, on their kind of time schedule. And so that's something that could be happening year round. So to look at the inventory and prescription cruising, that's done on a rough 20 year schedule. So all of our state forests are broken into what we call compartments. And those compartments uh, are visited about every 20 years, sometimes sooner, sometimes later, but, uh, that's a good average. Uh, and when the foresters go and do that work, uh, what they're looking for is, you know, what's the health of those stands? Uh, what's the size, maturity, quality of the trees that are in that stand, species composition, stand structure, all those types of things that you'd be interested in uh, as part of a forest stand. So those are the things that, that they look at. Uh, and they're also monitoring things, you know, maybe that aren't necessarily timber related. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned forest health, uh, any special sites, special um, ecological features, so vernal pools or um, waterways, that sort of thing can all be monitored while they're out there. Uh, you know, it just gives us a chance to kind of look at places of the forest that, um, aren't easily seen, you know, the foresters can really get out there off the roads and uh, make sure that we're able to monitor everything in the forest on that schedule. Uh, and once they collect that data in, in the stands that they're cruising, we use a program called Silva, which is uh, developed by the Forest Service. And the main goal of that is to help in managing oak stands. Uh, it, the data collected looks at oak seedling counts um, and the stand structure of oaks, the competitors, so things like red maple and beech that might be in that stand that would uh, inhibit the growth of, of the oak seedlings. Uh, so that's a program that's been developed to help make those decisions um, and help give the, the foresters a little more data to look at and, and decide what to do in those stands. And once they go through that whole process, then they'll end up with areas that have been recommended for timber marking uh, or other pre-commercial treatments going forward. Which leads us to the timber marking side of things. And like I just said, that that's all based off of what's come off the cruises from the previous years. And we consider a lot of things in that process Obviously, the, the type and the size of the timber is a large part of that, uh, but also when we go to put in boundaries for these places, uh, we'll look at the aesthetics, uh, recreational impacts, um, any special wildlife considerations. We look at the uh, 
threatened and endangered species databases to make sure that there aren't any impacts to any known um, t &E species. And then we also just have general zoning throughout all of our forests. So uh, places where there is uh, heavier recreation, maybe there's, um, we have resource protect protection zones generally by our larger streams, uh, just those sorts of things that um, are also considered. And once we go through and do the actual marking of the timber sales, those areas are all cruised again at a much um, higher intensity than they are in the initial cruise so that we can get uh, you know, good reasonable numbers when we go to, to sell those sales. Uh, and like it says there, then they're advertised and sold through a uh, sealed bid competitive process to the highest bidder. And then that leads into the timber sale administration. And like I said before, this is something that uh, kind of happens all throughout the year, uh, just depending on the logger schedule and what their workload is and when they're able to uh, make it into those stands and do the harvest. And during that time, uh, we have our field foresters uh, that are responsible for going out and monitoring those sales. Uh, and they'll, they'll look at uh, a lot of things, you know, that you would expect. So uh, is the logger harvesting the right trees? Are they doing things safely and correctly? Um, have we received the, the correct payments? Um, are there trees that have been damaged that need to be accounted for, all that sort of thing? Uh, our foresters are also responsible for doing the, the sale layout, so flagging in the skid roads. Um, and a lot of that is all done, you know, with the logger in conjunction with them to, to try and find an agreeable arrangement, you know, that, that works for everyone's interests. Uh, and then, you know, as the sales wrap up, they're responsible for making sure that all the BMPs are implemented correctly uh, according to, to the guidelines. And so here's just a, a little look at our harvest levels over time. So, you know, we have records that go back to the 40s, you know, kind of when the state forest harvesting was, was getting off the ground. And um, you can see it's, it's uh, gone up and down over time, uh, but you should see at least a general uh, trend and an increase in the volume harvested. And so uh, a lot of that is just a, uh, a product of us moving through time, you know, our forests are maturing, getting bigger. Um, you know, a lot of the harvests we do now are really looking at how do we regenerate these stands uh, to get to our desired conditions of, of uh, having oak trees into the future. Um, and so that's, that's really what you see there. And then just a little talk here on non-commercial um, treatments that we do. Uh, the big three of those that we encounter are just invasive species treatments, crop tree releases, and prescribed fire. And all of those are uh, contingent on funding. You know, them being non-commercial treatments means that it's a, it's a cost to us to do those things. Uh, the, the vast majority of that, we've been fortunate in the last several years to receive a lot of grants from the Forest Service that are focused on doing invasive species management um, and doing a little crop tree release. And then, you know, historically, there's also been uh, Forest Service grant money available for us to do prescribed fires uh, and controlled burns as well. So uh, all of those things, for the most part, are focused on also helping to uh, promote and increase oak regeneration in our stands. Uh, that's, you know, really the, the main, uh, main challenge that we face on the state forest systems is uh, the, the majority of those stands are oak dominated and how do we keep that oak going forward into the future. And then finally, just to, to wrap up here, wanted to talk about you know, what we feel are some of the benefits of us doing this management. Uh, so obviously the, at the harvesting part of things, 
you know, we're, we're doing a lot of habitat creation and over 60% of the acreage that we actually harvest is, uh, you know, some type of improvement thinning or selection harvest with the intent of benefiting the future stands. Um, and you know, the way that we've arrived at such uh, high quality stands in our state forest today is because we have this long history of management over time. And so um, the remainder of that that's not thinning are types of regeneration harvest. So um, shelter woods, clear cuts, deferments, that sort of thing, um, looking at regenerating stands that are mature. And a lot of those with the intent of trying to benefit oak regeneration in those areas. Um, and so white oak has been uh, a big focus of that, you know, there's obviously a lot of talk about the, the decrease in, in white oak and then worries about that, you know, economically and from a wildlife um, ecology standpoint. And so that's something that, that we're really keyed in on and focused on trying to uh, do what we can to, to promote oak management going forward. And then from the uh, other side of things, you know, obviously we we uh, have money coming in from these timber harvests, and so that's all redistributed, um, or you know, portions of that are redistributed back into the the local economies. And so you can see there that um, over time, you know, we've distributed over thirty four million dollars to uh, local governments, and then just in this past year. Uh, you know, we had 1.3 million. And so a lot of people are curious how that, uh, you know, compares to other uh, tax uh, CAUV type um, payments that would normally go to the county. And so over the past 10 years, we've averaged about $8 per acre from our timber harvest that have gone back to the community. Um, and for reference, the CAUV is generally around four dollars per acre, and so you know we feel like we're we're really able to to do a lot of benefit both for the forest and the local communities where we have our forests. And then just for this year in uh, our current year, fiscal year twenty one, which goes from uh, started in July of last year in twenty twenty, and we'll go through the end of June this year. Uh, we've advertised about 6 million board feet of timber uh, with about $1.5 million in revenue so far this year. Um, and so we're on the trend, you know, we'll, we should end up around that uh, 10 million board foot range, you know, give or take some by the end of the year, which would put us, you know, kind of on that average that we've had the last several years. And, uh, you know, just going forward in 2021, our division has the goal of uh, doing at least 1500 acres of harvesting this year uh, and trying to treat 300 acres of invasive species, uh, 50 acres of non-commercial treatment. So things like crop tree release, uh, and then trying to fit in five prescribed fires through the year, uh, which a lot of is, is weather and, and staffing dependent. And then also looking at doing five to seven acres of pollinator habitat, which would be um, up north where we uh, are able to do that sort of thing. And so uh, that concludes what I have on the, the state forest management. So I think now we're going to open this up for questions. Thanks, Jared. We did have one question come in to, uh, from Cassie Ridenauer. She says, and this is probably a good one for Tom to answer, says, what percentage of oaks in Ohio have been hit by oak wilt? Is it zero to 1%? Also, she wanted to make sure we threw a comment out there that our Tree Farmer of the Year tour later this summer will feature um, some oak wilt mitigation on that uh, Tree Farmer of the Year tour. So Tom, what do you think? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know that we can say for sure um, you know, what percentage of oak is affected by oak wilt. I, I think when you consider the whole state, uh, it's probably a pretty small percentage. Um, you know, we're aware of a few areas where it's, it's impacting trees, um, but you know, on a small scale, it's, it's pretty important um, and, and a major impact at the stand level. Um, 
but you know, I don't think it's super common across the state. Um, but you know, we're still trying to get a better handle on it. And I think it's certainly possible that it is more widespread than we realize, but uh, a lot of folks just aren't taking those steps to get it, you know, officially confirmed by a diagnostic lab. So yeah, sorry, I, I wish I could give you a better answer on that. That's a tough one. Thanks, Tom. Um, so that was the only question we had there, but we did have a question came in earlier that uh, Chief Balser, I think you're still on there if you uh, are listening. There was a question that came on earlier that may relate more to what you were talking about, and that is, are there many land trust groups as partners with the state to supplement the legacy programs? So there are a few land trusts who are involved, um, but not real extensively in terms of the legacy program so far. So our major partner on, on legacy initiatives so far, uh, and a lot of our land acquisition initiatives has been the Nature Conservancy. Um, but there are some other players coming in uh, into the picture who are uh, indicating that they're interested in becoming involved. So one of those would be the Western Reserve Land Trust up in Northeast Ohio. Of course, we don't own a lot of property in Northeast Ohio, and so we're not we're not actively looking in a lot lots of places in Northeast Ohio to add to state forest holding. Um, and then the um, there's some other partnerships that are being looked at from a department standpoint uh, with major land trusts. Um, so I don't have any specifics on that, Brad. Uh, I just know that there's there's a lot of things being talked about, um, much more so than in the past. But I would say that our major our major partner to date has been the Nature Conservancy. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we've got one more question that we'll take here before we break. Um, so this comes in from Tom Mills. It says, it sounds like we're doing a good job managing our state woodlands. How, how does what we're doing compare to what some of the Western states are doing regarding wildfires? I'll try to take that, Brad. Um, I, it, it's hard to generalize. I would say we've got some of the same challenges in that <clears throat> you know, fire used to be a much more part of the landscape here in Ohio. And we can see that in our forest types. And, and the West would see that as well. Um, I, I think a lot of their issues are more related to fuel. Uh, re, they're looking for fuel reduction projects, things like that that are gonna mitigate you know, large destructive wildfires. We don't quite have that issue here. So that would that'd be part of the difference I'd point to, but I mean, a lot of variety when you say you know, the whole Western fire problem. Okay, thanks, Greg. All right, we did have one more quick question thrown in here. This will be our last one we'll take here before break from Mike Bessonen. How many acres and board foot volume uh, were harvested last year on ODNR merchandising sales? Oh, Jared, if you want to answer that exactly, I can tell you about 20% of our volume uh, was merchandising, but I don't, I don't know acres wise. Yeah, as far as acres, um... I believe it was around, I want to say 150 or so last year. Um, and that's in, you know, when you consider that we usually harvest, and I think last year harvested around 2,000 acres. So kind of like Greg said, you know, it's in that 10% um, range acreage wise, maybe even a little less than that. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, really appreciate uh Dan, Craig, Tom, Jared, uh, great presentation here on uh, Division of Forestry and ODNR. Uh, appreciate that. Um, at this time, we're going to uh, take a little bit of a break. We're going to be back on at 1045 with a national policy update from the Forest Resource Association. So thank everybody for attending and uh, we'll be back on shortly. <laughs>